Thanks again to Solar and Solar Group for uh, allowing us to be here. It's a great place. So, without further ado, Justin. <laughs> so, uh, this is truly an introduction. I'm going to go to very shallow depth. And I just want to give um, a glimpse of kind of what GraphQL is and what you can do. So, a little bit of background. GraphQL um, was created by Facebook in uh, 2012, and it's been in production for them ever since. Uh, and they open sourced it. So, back to the question what is GraphQL? Their site says uh, it's a query language for GraphQL. Uh, which is great. Um, I didn't know. Uh, it's more than just a query language. Um, so it's, it's hard on. Um, it's a way for you to monitor your data and give you certain guarantee and deliver your data. So uh, one of the principles of uh, GraphQL is I see it's designed by contract. So this uh, document is a GraphQL scheme. And it's actually written in the DSL that GraphQL provides. You can have certain tools that actually can take this and will generate out. Um, well, this is a, a very simple, simple schema for uh, like a two batch, right? Um, so, so the top you can see the fine schema. There's a query implementation. Uh, so your types of query define is like what actions you can do, like what data you need to monitor. So you can see. Below the schema definition, I've defined the query type, and the only query that I have in there is tasks, right? So I can take that query or tasks on the record server, and it will give me back an array of task objects that I offer. It'll never be on the the array of data. So I'm always going to get an array of and I get to write about it, I can guarantee that I will have all the data from tasks. Jump down to look at the task list, ID types, and assignment. The interesting thing to note is that that's also our archive. So, task is just another type of type. So, when I work with you, make a request to the server. Okay, I want tasks as a part of our task. Back this object, um, but it didn't didn't have the X in the object. So that would be that would be an error. Grab your own error along with the failure. Hey, this failed because of some reason. Right. So it's a stack of and when you're defining your query, you're going to get the only one. So at the top of the um, it's it's a, a, a query for two, right? For us here. So I want to get the only one to do that. And I just want to text. Right. So the response is kind of directly specified. So if you deleted the query line, delete the right to do, that's kind of what kind of your response is. Um, so it's very clear what your payload is going to be back. Now, I could have included users in this and got them as your name, or user ID, or whatever, kind of whatever fields I want. Um, the interesting thing to note is behind every field, there's a function. So, you know, if I wanted, if I wanted to have analytics, it was on how many users. Query for this text, or how many times we query for this text property um, on to do this. So, you uh, can imagine, uh, like if you've worked with REST APIs and you had a field that was 
stuff like that, you can actually see kind of your usages of what the rules are actually being used, um, and then make adjustments based on that, or you know, definitions. Um, so, brief like insight into uh, what uh, a little setup might look like. So, um, your clients uh, could be whatever. IOS app, Android app, JavaScript, whatever. Um, and they might have a dedicated GraphQL client interface. Right? So some of you are in the React world or Relay. Relay is a GraphQL client. Right? It works with React. Uh, there are other ones. Um, but it doesn't, you don't have to have one. Just to be on your girl. Uh, your server, however, will always have a very thin GraphQL uh, runtime. So essentially, what the server does is it defines your schema. It defines what is available. So you have a single endpoint that you get. That's that server will say, here's what query for, here's what you need to get, what I accept. Um, and it will do things like uh, do validation. Right? So if you Query something that doesn't exist, and say it doesn't exist. If you make a query and like you're hooked up to a REST API, and that REST API returns a response, but uh, it's not what the server expects, and then it's that kind of client, it will send an error down so they don't understand, hey, uh, there's something wrong with um, your type of thing. Um, um, so, look back to the client's kind of So, uh, this is the Super simple query, which is a pretty good thing. Oh, no, let's see that. It's already there. So, uh, there are runtime server servers uh, to Apollo. That's wrong, actually. Uh, Apollo has a server that's not a great idea. So, there are a lot of Apollo runtimes, uh, and there are bindings for every one we have to So, you know, if you're asking about that, Want to use grab those? There's a button on there, so you can write, a, write your server, put it on and run it. JavaScript. So this is really the meat and potatoes of the talk. I have a lot of interesting uh, So um, um, there's a company called Apollo, and they went out with a lot of. Uh, so they have a yeah. server, a 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 server, so the HTML and the HTML is all the way down the So I'm going to give you a brief run So in this type test, I have a new query as So I've defined my query type, and it's got two critical items on it. I have a Got tasks. I have to find conditions where I can actually mutate. Uh, Justin, can you make it a little larger? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, so, as I was saying, I've got a mutation, so I can call that. So every server will have a schema. Right? The schema is the contract that says here's what you can query for, what you can do, here's what I look like. Uh, and then how the server gives the client back information or how it gets them is by resolvers. So resolvers are functions that get data from visions. All they are. Um, so if we look at the top level resolver object, we have this query object which maps directly with the type query and schema. Uh, 
So I can have a variable property of the code, and if you want to have it returns the text of the So if I ran this query in the load, and it returns all the ones, right? So based on the type, the load returns the string, and you can see that. So, if I were to require and say, turn it off, it's about to be able to do that. It's that point to kind of what, what went wrong. So, now we're trying to fill it all, not a lot of ability to query up all of So, it's uh, really nice for debugging your APIs, like, why is that breaking? What's going on? Um, uh, <laughs> Um, also, the same uh, demo of I kind of want to briefly show off uh, this tool called GraphQL. So, uh, this is something that pretty much comes with every GraphQL server implementation that I've seen. Um, and it's a bit like a big tool. So it like shows you what's available to me as a user of this API. So if I go to a document course, and I can see the So I can see what query is there. So I can click a query here and see, oh, well, I've got this couple of things, I've got this task, task, and task, 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 um, and you can also document the decisions. So if I were to come back uh, to my action scene uh, and put a comment about this hello uh, here. There's pizza here. But if you want to, 
use that to have an easier interface for some work script. Um, so uh, the real queries like uh, like this hello are, are relatively simple, right? So I've defined uh, this root query of hello which returns a string, you know, uh, and as expected, the return to this string. Um, task uh, is a little bit interesting. So it actually kind of returns the object. So it's not it's not primitive. It's the type that I'm defined, and it has different field types. Um, um, so, so when I, when I I'll, just, I'll just do it over here. Um, uh, or no, or no, uh, you can always have to uh, include at least one. Um, or, or, yeah, you always have to have one kind of field for one root node of the query, right? So, so tasks have many properties. I had to include one of those properties in this query to return. You always have to return time. In this case, probably won't be. You probably won't be. Um, so I'll do it from the query, um, and I have um, so really if I'm going to be able to actually build a two that I really want. Is this task finished? Oh, okay. Great, great. Um, so I can see now um, this this string here would be a string is what you would send to the server to so get this response. It won't be uh, on the right. right. Now you're like, okay, well, that's great. Um, you know, maybe I want um, <coughs> Alright, so right now we're returning all texts. Um, let's just get all texts. Uh, but what if Wanted to only return the tasks that I want to complete. So let's actually add add another task here. Hopefully the demo here will tell you. So I've added another task, a list of tasks. You can see your task list updated. So I've got, I've got two tasks in here. One has pizza, one has pizza, one has pizza here. One's finished, one's not. Um, but when I do this query, I just want to query what's my, what's my finished tasks. So you can actually add hard lines to our tasks, but this will uh, this will require us to update our scheme up a little bit. Um, so when we're querying our tasks, maybe we say uh, give it a uh, only property because what's this thing finished, right? Um, so now interesting. I guess it ignores it if you don't uh, provide it, but um, so you know we could say uh, finished is Oh, oh, so I know this came up, but obviously I didn't change the resolver, so there's nothing that's happening. Makes sense. Uh, so, it's a question, like, well, what would it be? It's kind of a, a simple scenario. So, we have this part of something that's passed back in this particular uh, RQL server. So we can say uh, we have we have a, a finished part. Um, so we'll just return task. Um, and So now uh, we have to get the filters out, whatever we're um, Another thing, uh, I didn't actually make this part. 
that's why I earlier when I queried it without looking at the areas So now that I've got the part ready, I've got the leads, you can expect so that it would actually care about. So now I've got a filter board here. So we can also do uh, yeah, I was wondering what that last key was actually is the last one? Yeah, the context right here. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, there yeah, there uh, your resolver options for uh, your queries have three properties. Um, your roots property is any like <laughs> values you set, so these are kind of like global values that you can set to pass to every um, every query. Um, in context, it's kind of a similar thing, but generally you would use it for um, like setting database drivers and things like that. It's kind of like it's kind of a way to share, uh, you know, API logic. So like a concurrent user and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever you feel like. Is it similar to the yeah. start parameter that you see a ton of C libraries that all have that way well, you'll pass it all back and you know, get started with all the cards and all the different parts of the stuff? Uh, are you talking about the context or just the callbacks? Huh. Um, like it's just now this is the way to start. I don't out. think so. I think it's like an object that you can uh, it's like a global property pack. Yeah. You can just throw it out just step in and whatever is useful to your resolve. Yeah. 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 Um, like you're saying, it's just, it's just a place to say that. Um, okay. So, uh, as I was saying, GraphQL is also a little bit hard. So, when I am querying the task, I also have this assignment. So, I can query for the assignment um, and get their name. So, um, when I'm returning to task, task is just returning whatever I get to, right? So, I have this method of create task. And this method of create task is it's just, it just creates an object, right? So, it's ID, whatever text you pass in, whatever uh, finish state you pass in, and it has uh, assigned zero. So, so it's always alternating zero. Right? And graphic like, oh, this is the thing that I expected, so I'm just going to turn it off. Um, so I mean, it's important to know that if you expect something to be present, uh, to you know, define it as required. Um, so, well, how do you? So I've, I've got like this API call right, that's coming back for, for my task, and it's defining the user ID, but my user is in a different place, on a different rest API, it's somewhere else, I've got to do something else to get that, so, so how do I do that? Um, I mean, granted, you always make uh, your query method really go back, and you can just keep adding stuff to that query function, but you know, that's not um, By default, how the resolver functions work, is this returns an object, some object, and all the parameters that you specify via your schema, it just tries to do a property access. So you have this property, all right, I'm going to return that. With this property, no, oh, this is null, unless I said that it can't be null and not be an error. Um, but if you want to do something special, there's a way to handle that as well. Um, so you can have. Uh, a special query for your data or a special resolve. Uh, so in this case, I've listed the task. So that will map, map up to the task property. And I said, hey, for my assignment fields, I want to do something special. Right? And so when I receive the assignment, the assignment is going to have some user ID. And then I want to return a very particular user on that. And honestly, this is supposed to be working. 
Um, but anyway, I'm not going to address the Pokemon. But that's kind of essentially how I would uh, get that. So I'll show you a real world in a second. So I have a scenario that I've set up chickens and actually All right, all right. Let me see. We'll start this off with the uh, data explorer. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit of work on work. Um, right now, there's not a lot of queries. It's pretty sparse. Uh, but let's say you want to query uh, to your project, right? So I said, hey, uh, you need to provide the project ED uh, and it will return to your project on uh, um, So looking inside that, you can see. Well, you can query the lead, and that return, that's returned as a Jira user. And then, you know, follow up on the Jira user has its own purpose. Uh, so, we're going to look at what the implementation of that looks like. Uh, what is the QL backtick? Um, so, yeah, this is actually. Um, uh, and ES6 uh, kind of semantic sugar for uh, just calling a quick on a string, uh, to, uh, string of rule. So, that's weird set that acts, but we did uh, use a lot in the GraphQL examples. So, this is literally just defining a part of my scheme. But in the case of 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 the case are you saying find the topic from the class? Okay. I'm going to switch my time a little bit. Yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry. Oh, my. It's not. So I was uh, I was a developer of this, and I rolled back the versions for uh, the demo to make sure it was stable. I don't know where I did it. So, so what happened? You know, a lot of this back really quick. Um, so I Instead of sending an entire query string, you send the ID of the query. 
It also gives you a lot of safety in your application, so you don't have to worry about like query points because that's an absolute thing. Right? You had an infinite object nesting. Somebody was like going like deeper and deeper and deeper, deeper with uh, query calls. And, you know, you have to detect that complexity. So one good way around it is, is just sending IDs to the servers and sending them over here. But uh, um, so why do we want to build your query dynamic? So uh, you can do uh, variables in GraphQL um, on top of what you uh, kind of see here. So let's say uh, I want to say, I want to call this, uh, this is my get task. Uh, and I want to provide a finish query. So if I could change my query here. <laughs> and as uh, an extra parameter, when I'm sending a request to you know, get this query, I can add that uh, finished uh, field, and I'll just say, that results in the I'll say finish false, right? So uh, the request would be the string, and then whatever you're going to call this variable's object, and then this variable's right? So you can kind of prioritize your queries. Um, I haven't talked too much about uh, mutations yet, but mutations are also within the people. So mutations are how you take that answer. Um, so GraphQL doesn't really say what that means or define how you do that. And so technically, it would be bad practice, but your queries can mutate things and your mutations can query things. It's like, it's, it's very loose because it's just executing functions and returning where you want to return. Right? So uh, don't do that. But, uh, so we have an example mutation, which is add pass. Uh, so you'll never know that uh, add or return this mutation is a list of tasks, which is the same thing for the tasks query. Um, so when I run this mutation, the GraphQL server will run the resolver function for our mutation and will do whatever it is to do. And then when that returns, uh, it will take the result of that, which should be an array of tasks. And then it. So I can also do kind of a pseudo query on the result of this thing, like just say, all right, well, you're going to return all these tasks and that's all the text. Or maybe I don't want to do that. So the so I'm, I'm naming the mutation. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can erase it as a white mutation. But in if you ever actually use dark pretty much all your queries and mutations um, you have to do that running multiple. Um, and also, it makes the uh, stack traces errors much easier to deal with. So, in this, uh, I'm going to run the app and the task mutation. Um, uh, so one thing I didn't mention earlier is um, the parameters for your root are all, uh, you have to explicitly uh, define what's the parameter you're uh, going for. They're all named. Uh, so you can't just like have, you know, parameter zero, parameter one, parameter two, or you have JavaScript. Uh, they're all named. So if I just erase this, just say, uh, I'm going to store a bit more, plus the parameter one, parameter two, So, Again, it's going to return uh, a list of tasks, so it's like your text. Um, so it will add, go to the store, to my result, or to my array of uh, tasks, and then return uh, the results. Um, you can also uh, you know, find arguments for this, like, like everything else. So if I had, uh, I really can just make this a replacement. Uh, that way, when I'm 
looking at my query, looking at my plan, whatever, I don't have to specify, um, you know, I don't have to specify the uh, language. Um, so, so that's kind of a really high level uh, intro to uh, things we're going to do. So uh, there's a lot more that I obviously didn't cover. I didn't show you an actual client. So um, I, I would recommend um, looking up dev.apologdata.com. So Apollo, like I said, is a company who uh, is building uh, tools for uh, record of hospitalization. Um, so they have examples on their site of direct and get and follow together. Um, Apollo being a uh, client React binding from RFL um, to build out uh, an app. So they have they define uh, <laughs> problems of uh, data and GraphQL query. Um, so this whole section here is their GraphQL string, right? So um, I hate it when people do this, but a little bit lost with uh, GraphQL. If you're doing a query, you don't actually have to define what it is. You can just give it brackets, like a JavaScript object, and then put text inside of it. And it's like, oh, well, I don't know what this is. It must be a query. Don't do that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, so they have this query of uh, feed, and they're, they're actually creating the uh, API uh, and query repository with the name of um, And when this is returned, they're passing in this uh, feed, what is a React component, um, and it decorates it. Um, this like higher level React already kind of into it. So uh, you just put this in place and all that goes to your query, and there's also things with protections. Uh, for example, I'm not going to go really deep into that. Um, there are a ton of clients for GraphQL in all sorts of scenarios. Um, so I, you know, I would suggest you uh, check out Apollo. They also are very interested in like a jump, you know, JS sort of. Just I don't want to framework anything. They have uh, kind of just their vanilla approach to it. Um, GraphQL itself, while it's open source from Facebook, they gave a reference implementation, but that's that's it. They don't have any like production level code of open source. I mean, they have tools, but no like actual stuff to use. But um, if you're interested in uh, GraphQL as if you're interested in you know, how GraphQL works and what it does, uh, you can go to yeah. Uh, you actually go to the GraphQL repository uh, on uh, Facebook. Uh, they have a link to the actual language that I so uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. It talks about how uh, some of the types of uh, and also introspection and stuff like that. Um, GraphQL itself also has uh, its own site, uh, and I highly recommend that. Um, it kind of, you know, goes to the basic stuff, um, but it gives you a lot of information about um, the language itself, like builds and fragments. There are even things <coughs> that I can recover, like um, fragments. So you can Find a reusable piece of a query and plug that in. So this is pretty much how Facebook builds all of So just like all of their all their record records are built off of records. So yeah, there's a ton of stuff to learn about GraphQL. There's a ton more information out there, um, but that's pretty much all I have. Are there any questions? It's interesting. Um, the general implications of the previous set, set of, say, if you in your example here, you had you had a task and an assignee. If you wanted to change the assignee, for example, or change the name of the assignee, whatever, 
uh, any mutation would have to start from the, the top of the hierarchy and give you all those specific pieces all the way down. Yeah, I think, um, don't want me to do this, but I think you could also do, uh, you could also do nested mutations. Um, I just, that must be good, because I, I don't know that. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't made three years of myself. Okay. Um, also, uh, Kind of depends on your graph level and implementation that you're using, right? So, so Facebook just really is a spec. Right. Um, so there are tons of different implementations out there. Apollo is the one that I use a lot just because it's really well documented and it's straightforward. But if you use any other language bindings, um, you know, you might have to do something custom and they handle it different ways, right? So Apollo is a good support for actually around uh, kind of. Kind of not not a single thing you replace, right? So it will, if you're making multiple requests, what it actually does all together is just send an array request instead of like do a request, do a request. Do a request. Uh, and so uh, the story is for things like caching and performance really in general is just kind of dependent on the implementation. So if you're looking at this for a production level application, I would just say that you do a lot of research because um, it's very powerful, it's very flexible, but it has to go around long enough to have a lot of you know corner cases and everything like really well done. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, and also, I guess kind of last thing, um, GraphQL uh, GitHub has a, a GraphQL API that uh, it just <coughs> Pulled out of developer preview, it's an alpha now. Um, but you can come on and get a you know GraphQL uh, Explorer, so you can kind of just I don't know, toy around with their uh, their API. There's really a lot. Of so check that out. I think it was a trending on Twitter today or something. I think they officially announced it today. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been open for a while and you can access it, but it's just something for developers for you. So, I think it's just a little bit So, goal-wise, the initial part of the rest of the field. Right. So, there is a, there's a few things that you can say about some of the RQL. So, it's kind of hard to be uh, Actually, I'm going to be in the like, they just say, Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> what? That's you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's true. <laughs> <later. laughs> <laughs> So you can do, you know, optimization, right? So if you've done static queries, maybe you get a query that's really not performant. Um, you can completely say, hey, server, I want you to short circuit. This query comes in, and I get this ID. That we have this <laughs> Instead of doing that, I want you to run a SQL and then return it. Right? So you can do things like that, like hyper optimization to some specific queries. Um, you can actually label a field as uh, dedicated. So when somebody gets the API, they'll be warning, like, hey, this goes deprecated. And it shows up in the documentation. And it's, uh, it's really nice. Uh, they call it uh, versionless, like you don't need to version the uh, API. And if you have good API design, it's really good. Um, the other thing is it's just it's really, really 
flexible. And so we can just do a bunch of functions. Right? So I have a schema with fields and field maps to the function. So if I want to get my users and my user has a name, and in order to get that name, I need to go to some other server and do that. Whatever. <laughs> it's like super easy. To do. I mean, it's not that you couldn't do that. Uh, it's just. Uh, I just said that I think the first thing the RPG and the other first thing and the other first thing are the So, so the uh, schema for a particular API endpoint uh, and maybe it's wrong for this case, but it's too narrow for this case. And so, a lot of times the answer to that is to create a bunch of different recipes and drives with different versions or different uh, or adding data fields or whatever. Here we track you out. You're exactly you're getting exactly what you need. I that query. Yeah, I missed the most obvious thing. Yeah. So over time, you know, graphic or a REST API, it's an So you need to use the data or change the way data is reported, but you don't want to break your old apps. It's been in production for years. Um, so you just have to keep adding fields, or you have to create them. So the graphic you have your query is you say, I know that there are 100 properties available, but I don't want to. And being that's kind of this hierarchy structure, you can like really dive into your data and get kind of these nested structures that have a lot of relations. Whereas if you had a REST API, they were using uh, was it Ross or something where it returns a URL. So you got this. REST API and it's got a resource, it's a user, and you get that URL, you can make another request and get you know their project, make another request and get either their product or whatever. It's like keep adding up all these requests, but we have to go and just break one Twitter and request and get all the um, Yeah, so Yeah, uh, I mean, you can extract a database on a track throughout there, right? And then you can look at your queries and decide, okay, well, you don't want to send the rejoin on a lot of things. Which is, that's the cool thing about track throughout, is you can do that behind the scenes. Or you can optimize the people's queries. So if you know that you're having to do with a bunch of things in this and I can map a schema behind the scenes in the software, I'm, I'm actually doing that kind things. Things like that. So it's more efficient. Probably that right there. Yeah, I, I think the, the really interesting thing is for me is you can have one, one data source. So for, for what I'm doing for we have a commit, right? Uh, and we prefix our commit with our Jira ticket numbers. So when I do a GraphQL, for commits, it's actually querying, it's, it's hitting Git, it's actually running Git on the server and doing a log and seeing what all the, the commits are or whatever. Um, and then you know, I, can, I can query for a hash or And then when I get that back, it has the string prefix of the Jira ticket. So I also have the Jira proper, the Jira ticket that's queryable on that. So I can query a commit via hash and then I can get the ticket. So I can say, here's the get uh, commit message, here's it worked on it, and here's the ticket description, or whatever. Right? So I can make these relations on this one kind of one property, uh, or one object that kind of normally. You know, I mean, it's kind of a lot like foreign data sources, and yeah. that's a relational database here. Yeah. Very same sort of integration comes here. And It's truly a, an abstraction, I mean, an abstraction layer that really allows you to put this defined schema on top of pretty much anything. It really doesn't matter what's in the back end, and that's one of the coolest things. And so you think about, like, on Node.js, uh, Walmart has done a great job of uh, putting a Node.js front end on all these legacy systems that we have, and all kinds of, you know, maybe it's Java, maybe it's Something else or whatever. But you asked them to get the ability to put a 
nice API layer on top of that, and I think GraphQL gives you yet another tool to even enhance it. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that GraphQL is too So, the um, thing is with REST, it's been around a while. It's really well defined. We want to talk about caching and other components. Uh, you know, we know what to expect. Um, if you want to do things like, uh, hey, I only want to get certain uh, items back to my resource, you know, there are eight, like there are ways to do that with uh, graphics or REST API. So if you actually get in use use Jenkins, Jenkins has a parameter tree. You can specify, you know, I'm I want I'm getting this uh, route for this uh, job, but I only want, you know, these fields. You can also specify depth, so if those fields have their own fields and another endpoint, you can get like depth. You can kind of sort of do the same thing uh, that GraphQL does and have just like a uh, well So, you know, it's, it's not crazy new concepts. I mean, I want to say that like, I mean, because I know we've talked about the hack meetup. I think the big thing for me is I use a lot of. Um, Things reflection to make machine readable definitions. I have my REST APIs. I mean, taking that one step further and generating um, some resolvers that you can use in a graphical you know, front end. I mean, I'm still going to run my, if I already use this stuff, I still use my REST APIs and this, and then kind of push a layer to generate the stuff for me. So, I mean, they, they complement each other. Question, is it practical? Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it is the first thing that I expect done on the graphical client side or is that It's done by the server. So when the client receives anything from the graphical server, she's on it. Okay. Uh, and it really doesn't do anything. So your server parses the graphical DSL queries, whatever that comes to, comes to it. From the client, uh, it does validation. Um, it does all kinds. It wants all kinds of things. So in that case, are there servers that because if you're going to be exposing the graphical queries client, then that means that if the client has the input, so does anybody else. So does the user. So how how do they are you have this this graphical design? So yeah, so the a story around security directly low is still wrong. So um, when you use some directly low uh, server, you can have this. Right? So one of the things you can do is secure that endpoint. Like you can do a REST API or anything else, right? I have the entire directly uh, low API is behind some security. Kind of an all or nothing access. When you want to get more granular than that, there are solutions out there. Again, it's still evolving. I wouldn't rely on that too much. Um, the other thing to think about is, like I was earlier, is query complexity, right? So if you had an infinite, you get objects, that was objects, that was objects, and people could like potentially bring down your server by just like sending you this crazy complex query. So if you're going to actually out of that, you've got to check where you're in a lot of things. So, my thoughts is that graphical APIs are really good in terms of So, if you're building a mobile app at work, it's a really great way to take all your disparate data sources and like turn them into one and release the thing that came from And then, you know, over time, you can all convert it and you're doing a request from your uh, Whatever your app is, just get the data you need and say, well, all the time. That's really good. Ready for public? We just, I think GitHub's ready for public views. It's just, you just have to be really careful about your resolvers. I mean, you need to know that you don't want to give them a million records that 
potentially if they put a query together like that. You have to put constraints on your developers. Yeah, so GitHub does a uh, force pagination and they have some good tools that So is there any direct support for so I was actually is there any direct support for pagination or is it just a like direct kind of support no. API? So all of this stuff I can I guess I'm broken right now, but all of this stuff is still So there are libraries that you can integrate that have pagination. You can make uh, make kind of reusable. The schema language is flexible enough where you can like apply a uh, pagination pattern to all of your terms. But but out of the box, no, there's there's nothing like that. Well, the Hollow Server, for example, has a pagination. Yeah. 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 There's, yeah. It's under Are we talking about you wanted to provide security between each like fill query or the repository? I mean, so I don't necessarily know. I mean, one option would be to provide different, you have like different schemas for different, uh, you know. Sorry, my, yeah, my understanding right now is the, the document says to collect uh, user authentication, uh, user authorization in the software. So if you want to limit fields, if you want to limit queries, things like that, you would, that's where you use your contacts object. You know what the current user is, you know what their authorization is. And that's how you can do that. Yeah, I mean, you can absolutely do that. I, I just, so my thing is, you can mess that up. It would be, it would be easy to mess that up. So it makes me happy. Um, yeah, so it's actually, <laughs> what is Say that the yield file that you already have to think about in terms of that. What is the best thing that you have? I don't know, and I don't know necessarily that that's very detailed about that. So I'm not sure. Because, like, he said it's all too fun. So you like to call it in some kind of IT that you would call up another internet to actually be called Yeah. So it's, it's more, I don't think it's that's necessarily one of the It can lead up to it, but I don't know if you want to Oh, well, one other thing. They're working on, uh, you're, there's a Evolving, the spec is evolving, so they have uh, subscriptions that they're working on, which is like a real time communication. Sort of. It's more like notifications, right? So um, you can implement a subscription server, which generally is just like a close up system or whatever, have your communication protocol, so it can be like web sockets or something like that, and uh, you can admit uh, subscription limits on certain, certain things that happen, right? So maybe when a uh, like in your mutation resolver, some people will just say, hey, when this thing happens, I want to push out a message to my web services, and like Amazon's notification or something. Like that. that can send a you know, real time update. <laughs> uh, cool. Anything else? Good? Cool. Thank you. Christopher, you have to wave it enthusiastically. Let's stitch this together. Excellent. All right. Thanks, recruit wise, for the pizza. See you next time. Got that. We are selling talks, so if you want to give a talk, if you never give a talk, give a talk.